A lot's been going on in the world, and as you're going to hear this morning, uh, a lot has happened as quickly as in my lifetime I've ever seen it happen. Uh, and so I have the, the blessing that we have here at Acts Church is we have a lot of teachers, right? We have the best looking teacher, that's me. And, uh, the, oh, sorry. And then we have uh, the, the JV team. Um, and so, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Actually, we have teachers who have been doing it decades longer than me um, and have moved out of the way only to let some of the younger folks like myself uh, get their shot. But we have two men in the church who have spent absolutely, between the two of them, I would guess 50, 60, 70 years worth of uh, time. I mean, honestly, probably the last, probably 40 years each studying uh, what we call eschatology, which is end times um, the prophecies in scripture, the book of Revelation, Ezekiel, Daniel, these different places where we hear about what's going to happen at the end. Uh, and these are things that get revealed over time, and they have put a lot of study and time and effort into it. And you have the benefit at, in this church of being able to hear from these men this morning um, who are going to kind of put a framework and put in perspective for you some of the things that have happened recently and some of the things you should expect to see. Because as believers... Well, one of the duties that we have as elders and pastors at this church is to teach well about what the scripture says. And when the scripture starts literally happening in front of us, you need to know or else you just be afraid. Because uh, there's a lot of things people are afraid of right now. But you don't need to be afraid because there's a framework for all the things that are going on right now that, well, is a tragedy because it's the beginning of sorrows for many people, as you've seen if you've watched the news. It's also an, a huge, exciting blessing. For those of us who are in the Lord and who probably will be with him soon, uh, many of us without having to taste death probably. So um, I that's all I'm going to give you for right this second. I'm going to invite Pastor Dave, uh, Pastor Dr. Dave Robinson and Dr. Dr. Dave Robinson. <laughs> oh. Yeah, give them a hand. You're going to have to hold it for a while. They're slower than me. It takes them a minute. And we're going to let them uh, just bless us this morning with, you got that? All right. Um, so let's listen to them when we're done. We'll, uh, we'll take communion together. And if you have questions, I just want you to know that um, they, there is an entire, we have, I believe, 53 sessions online on the app right there on the front page. It says End Times Prophecy Session. I think there's like 53 sessions of End Times Prophecy um, teaching going through the entire Bible that Dr. David, Pastor Dave, and Scott Robertson have, have done for us. And so after this is over, if you want to know more, you've got, you know, 100 hours of stuff there that you can do. So that's like a week's worth of Netflix for you all. Um, you, can, you can handle it. So let's welcome Pastor Dave and Dr. David, and let's hear what they have to say. First off, let me make sure we can be heard. I'm coming through okay? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Could be a little louder. You don't want him to be too loud, let me tell you. I can get real loud. <laughs> no, no, please. Okay. As Pastor David mentioned, uh, we've been spending, my good brother David and I, uh, over a year now exploring biblical prophecy. And that was because there was an interest amongst uh, a group of people in the church. So we organized that, and that launched last year, way back when. We've been having Zoom sessions uh, ever since. Frankly, uh, that's probably the best way for us to meet with this because it's highly content-driven, and it saves people having to jump in their cars and run around and everything else. It would probably cut attendance by over 50% if they had to drive to some place. Uh, it's been successful, though, I would say, David. Very, far beyond what I ever thought, that's for sure. I thought we'd do it like in six weeks. <laughs> we, forget that, man, I'm telling you. Of course, yeah. somebody's a long time. His time was not long enough. Okay, so what we're going to be doing this morning, uh, you're all well aware of the fact that uh, over the last two weeks, in a day or so, the world has changed. Uh, as a historian, as a student of international relations, 
I've uh, done a lot of work in this area formally and over the years in teaching. There has been no change in the world's framework as significant as this since World War II. None. And I want to emphasize the fact, and David and I have talked about this at some length, it has happened overnight. Yes. Two and a half weeks ago, things were as they had been ever since the Soviet Union fell. The West assumed that, okay, the boogeyman's gone. Globalization under Bill Clinton and others moved ahead. The United States was the only superpower, uh, which remains true, by the way. Um, and more and more, it was global terrorism and 9-11 and going after terrorist groups. And the days of worrying about Russia was, they were in the rearview mirror. China was its own kettle of fish, of course, um, and we kept an eye on the Chinese, but the world seemed to lose the intense focus that it had had during the Cold War years, which ran from roughly 1945 until 1991. In two weeks, that's all changed. And I mean, it has all changed. Those of you who are younger will not remember the world as it then was. The structures, the paradigms, the interpretive frameworks. I studied under Dr. Joseph Ha at Lewis and Clark College, who himself had studied directly as a doctoral student under Henry Kissinger. And I took every course from him that I could in international relations. We had a great relationship ourselves. He would have been startled and stunned at what happened in the last two weeks. There, literally, those who have delved deeply into this, they don't have any parallels. It's never happened this way. And so we need to, we need to be thinking in terms of what's happened because it's really happened. And what are the possible prophetic connections that we have? Because the closer we get to the end, I will tell you, history is self-authenticating in terms of prophecy. Quite often we learn the significance of biblical prophecy as we move into the period in which it's going to be executed. Remember that biblical prophecy is really the divine decrees of God. Absolutely. This is... When we speak of plan, you hear the God's plans and so forth. These are really, we'll go beyond that. These are his appointed sovereign decrees which shall not be resisted. The things that the Lord said, these will be, will be. I, you know, when I think of prophecy, I, I often think of a thousand piece puzzle and you don't have the picture of what it looks like. So what do you do? You, you start putting it together. You, you do the edge pieces first normally. Then you start filling it in and you start guessing, what does this look like? But then as more pieces get in there, you start, the picture starts to emerge. And, and the prophecy has been, we've been receiving these pieces. And we've, there's been all kinds of conjecture, all kinds of ideas. Well, I think maybe that's a fountain. Oh, I think maybe that's whatever. But as the pieces come together, you start to see the picture that God has for us. And that's what, it, that's what he's talking about when he says prophecy is fulfilled in its time. And before that, all you can do is guess. And there's been a lot, a lot of wrong guesses. So uh, that's just a, just a little explanation that people for uh, early church believed in a literal interpretation of the prophecies just as the ones were for Jesus. He would be born in Bethlehem. All those prophecies were, were direct and, and fulfilled directly as stated. They believed also that the prophecies returning of Christ were literal. But along about, well, it started a little earlier than that, but really there was a 
uh, Augustine came along and said it is nothing is literal. And that changed people's view on prophecy and it's been a confusion ever since. But the literal, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today, is the literal fulfillment of prophecy. What God says, God will do as he said it. And you're gonna see this morning how that's taking place right out of Ezekiel 38 and 39. That's an essential point. There are many different schools of prophecy, biblical prophecy, and one can get highly confused. Matter of fact, the more research you do, quite often the more confused you become because there are so many dueling points of view within the church. But this is a fundamental point. This is the foundation upon which all proper understanding of the scriptures is based. Mm -hmm. No prophecy is by any interpretation, private interpretation, say the scriptures, that the word of God is to be in interpreted literally. That the word knows how to use words. Mm -hmm. uh, he knows how to make things clear to us. And so we're going to assume a literal interpretation of the scriptures. When you do, a very definite picture emerges. It's not unclear, fuzzy, or even chaotic mm -hmm. the way that other interpretations of the scripture based upon biblical symbolism or a non-literal interpretation of the scriptures uh, it is based upon delving into the word, reading the word, studying the word, and doing so continually, as the scriptures say, in Deuteronomy 6. You know, from the time you get up in the morning till the time you go to bed at night, and in between in all the places, consider the word of the Lord. It should be constantly. As a matter of fact, I, I think that if you do things properly, the boundary between study and and meditation and prayer goes away. They are, the, they become the same thing. You'll find yourself moving from one to the other and back and back and back and forth and back and forth. So, enough said on that. As you reflect and meditate on the word, as you bring the, Lord in, uh, the word into you, you will become the word. You will live it out. People will see it in you, the sweet aroma of Christ. That's our, that's our assumption. We're sticking by it, we ain't changing. <laughs> okay, so what we wanna do today is we wanna take a look at what is now sort of commonly referred to as the Ezekiel War. Yes. This is something that has been discussed. Uh, I've actually been studying the prophetic scriptures as a historian, Christian historian, 45 years plus now. I was teaching this all the time. The nice thing about teaching history in a Christian high school is you get to constantly develop. You're constantly in it, sharing it. Every time you share it, of course, the teacher always learns more than anybody in the room. Uh, so I've been through this dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of time, and I've never left it. Um, it was the reading of a book on biblical prophecy that brought me to Christ. So, there is a particular passage in the scriptures you need to be intensely aware of if you're not already. It's Ezekiel 38 and 39. Because in it, God speaks uh, of the end times and says that in the end times, there is going to be a leader who forms an alliance. And the members of that alliance are specifically listed. And that he is going to conceive a wicked thought. David, maybe you'd care to comment on this wicked this, leader. This, this prophecy <clears throat> in Ezekiel 38 and 39 has been misunderstood so long it's unbelievable. But it's clear it becomes extremely clear today to in just about anybody who'll just take a moment to look at it. 
It is so specific to the current situation, it's unbelievable. A man from the north called Gog will come from the north and come on down. He will gather to himself a group of nations who will join with him to attack Israel. That is the Ezekiel War. <clears throat> the first part of that is clearing and making a way, a pathway down into Israel, which is being done presently as we speak. That's being done. As you read Ezekiel 38 and 39 with this understanding, you, you're just kind of blown away. Uh, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people in Israel dwell safely, you will know it. Israel is probably one of the strongest, I would say the strongest military might in the Middle East. They export weapons. That tells you how many weapons they have. They're dwelling safely right now, although they've had multiple attempts to destroy that. It doesn't happen. They're dwelling safely. And this, this man from the north, Gog, is going to recognize this time for him, the appointed time. See, God has a timing, and it's an appointed time. So it says, it will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land. Amen? Does that give us the context from which we are in right now? In the la latter days? That's what's going on right now? The latter days? And here comes Gog. <clears throat> it says he's going to set a hook in his jaw and drag him down to the land of Israel with a coalition, and, their, and, the, and the countries are listed right there in Scripture. Yeah, we're going to cover those. One thing that's of extreme interest to me is that Ezekiel 38 and 39, when you look for when and time sequence and the like, those, those events occurred just before Ezekiel 40 to 48. There were all the rest of the book, which is about the millennial kingdom and the millennial temple of Christ. You, you jump directly from the end of that into the Lord talking about the millennial temple. Now, when we say millennial, in case you don't know what that is, it's the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth with his saints. That's you. Any believer belongs to Jesus Christ will come down for a thousand years and rule with Christ. In fact, I think he's going to give me a cult to watch over. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, this is, this is the millennial reign, just without getting too complicated because it takes a great deal of time to drill into this. What we're, what we're seeing is we are coming up on the times of the end. Then at the end of this age, the Lord will take his church. Paul talks about that in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 Thessalonians 2, etc., etc., etc. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, we're, we're told the church is going to be taken. The church is not appointed to wrath. Furthermore, the tribulation that's coming is for Israel. Mm -hmm. The time of Jacob's troubles. The 70th week of Daniel that you'll find in Daniel chapter 9. 70 weeks have been appointed upon your people, Daniel, and upon your holy city. The end of the 69th week, do you know the exact day that the 69th week ended? Christ was slain in Jerusalem. But 70 weeks were appointed. The clock stopped. Israel was cut off. When they cut off the Messiah, Israel was cut off. Mm -hmm. That is not to say that God hates Israel. That is not to say that God has replaced Israel. That is not to say that God is not going to fulfill all of his covenants regarding Israel. He will. Why? Because they're so great? No, because he is. He will fulfill his promises for his name's sake. And that's listed there in Ezekiel 38. They'll bring him back to the land. They'll re-inhabit. It says a land that was desolate will be re-inhabited. Israel produces more uh, crops than anybody else in that area. They export this little tiny 
country, I mean, it is tiny, produces unbelievable amount of crops. And they, and they give it another day. So the land was desolate. It said, read it in 38. You recognize Israel right away. It was desolate. And then God brought his people back to the land. In 1948, that began to happen. And you uh, now know why the Holocaust. Yes. There is only one answer to why the Holocaust. Why Shoah? Why were the millions slain? The Lord said, the time has come for you to return. I will no longer allow you to wander. You will come back if I have to ble plead with you in death by the millions. Now this is what we're talking about when we're talking about the sovereign, absolute decrees of God. This shall be. You shall not assimilate. You will remember that you are my people. You will return to your land. They wouldn't do it voluntarily. Then came Hitler. Okay, so since May 10 of 1948, Israel's back in the land. That was the most significant sign of that time. Indeed, it has set the clock ready for everything that is to fall. And by the way, that was a huge turn in understanding prophecy. Because how can you have somebody sitting in a temple that doesn't exist? How can you have uh, the, the prophecies about Jerusalem if Jerusalem didn't exist? So this was May 14th, 1948. Israel declared themselves to be a nation. Right. And that day was a watershed moment when the literal understanding of prophecy came clear into view. Because now you do have a place. You do have the things that are happening literally not figuratively, literally happening. That's, that was key. That's, that was the key to, to Hal Lindsey writing his book in 1967, The Late Great Planet Earth, which was a bestseller for a long time and stirred up renewal of understanding the end times in literal understanding of scripture. Right. So in 1967, Israel having defended itself Several times. In 67, Israel captured Jerusalem. I, had, I, I talked to friends who said at that time they, they were just standing there wondering if the Lord was going to take the church now. Well, that was how Lindsay, he, that's what he said. He said, if you got a 30-year mortgage, don't worry about it. <laughs> and I just want to let you know that those people that took out a 30-year mortgage are upset because they paid it off about 20 years ago. The fact is that in 73, there was another attempt to destroy them. Yes. It was crushed. The Golan Heights were seized. The West Bank was taken, uh, which is of significance as we're going to see here in just a moment. So moving quickly, because we're at a 30,000 foot view, we're trying to give you an overview and a framework. We're not, not going to be able to fill it all in here. Uh, as a side note, however, if you want to go into greater detail on this, note that online in the video library for our prophecy studies, sessions 24 and 25, which total about three hours between them, cover Ezekiel 38 and 39 in detail. So just go online, sessions 24 and 25, dig in. Let me give you the We'll talk about this high view on who's involved. First yes. off, there's a cast of the enemies of Israel. Okay. Here's the cast of the enemies. Okay, this is underneath Gog. I guess I should say something about Gog. Gog literally is a, is a term that means leader. Gog of the land of Magog of Rosh and Tubal. I'll just frame that together and say that's Russia. Flat out. Meshek, Moscow. Tubal, Tobolsk. Armenia, Russia. It's, it's just a gigantic reference. And the Lord also refers to it as the uttermost parts of the north. Take a map 
look at Jerusalem, go north. What do you find to the uttermost parts of the north? Russia. Period. There can be no doubt. The only way you can interpret it any other way is if you do not use a literal interpretation of the scriptures, in which case the scriptures will turn to dust in your hand, blow away, and you'll be wandering around looking for a coffee shop. And if you take a ruler on the map, and you... And it's you, almost directly north. You take uh, Jerusalem, and you go to Moscow, you'll see it's almost directly north. No, there cannot be any question when the scripture says, I will bring you from that land, and he says, uh, I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you, down he goes. Drag. Brings by, with hooks in the jaw. Drag. We'll talk about what that means uh, a little yeah. later. So we have Gog. We're going to come back to Gog in a moment. It is a human being. That is not, the land of Magog is this, described, it's listing Russia. Yeah, the word of the Lord can be saying, Son of man, set your face against the prince of Rosh. That's a person. The prince, prince. The prince of, the, of the Rosh, the Russians. Yeah. Um, but Gog is a person. Magog, Rosh, those, those describe a national extent or empire. Coming with him, according to Ezekiel, will be the following. Some of these names are going to sound very, very familiar. Iran, Turkey, Ethiopia, Somalia, Libya, Afghanistan, Iraq, Armenia. Basically, you can think of it as a swath of militant Islamic areas dedicated to jihad and to the Shia vision of destroying the unbeliever. They will come in the name of their end time leader, the 12th Imam. Uh, there you can read the Antichrist. They think he's the Messiah. If you Back do a study of that, you'll see uh, that there, this 12th Amon is prophesied to come. It's, it is a, a mirror of the reality of Jesus coming. We have our Messiah coming. They have their Messiah coming as the 12th Amon. And, you'll, and you, if you study Islam, you'll see a lot of parallels that Muhammad took from the book, people of the book, the, the Jews. Uh, but that's, that's the key thing. It's a, it's a false one of, of Christ. It's a type of antichrist, in mm -hmm. a sense. Not the antichrist, but a type of Christ. Well, we have to remember, too, that the antichrist will come with the false prophet. Yes. So there's a false prophet there kicking around as well. Um, let's talk one night stands. That got their attention. It. it got my attention too. Who knew? On one hand, we have Gog, the land of Rosh. He has his own plans. What we're seeing right now is he's executing a plan, a vision. It's all around Rosh generally and him, his personal power, wealth, fame, and the position of Russia in the world. On the other hand, we have militant Islam. It has its own, its own agenda. Yes. Its agenda can be very simply summed up by saying, Israel must be destroyed. Destruct, destruction of Israel. That is it, that is it. There is no other agenda. You go, if you go to Iran, you can hear it all day long. Listen to Hezbollah. Listen to Hamas. From near and far, the cry of radical terroristic Islam is death to Israel. And since we're the ones that really prop them up, death to the U.S. too. Yeah. 
And your sister's ugly too. <laughs> okay, so when I speak of the one night stand, you have to understand it's not like radical Islam loves Moscow. And it's not like Moscow has a whole heck of a lot of use for radical Islam. But together, there's one thing they do agree on. What's the one thing they agree on? Your enemy is Israel. Enemy. Jerusalem. We know what radical is. Radical Islam just hates them. And what does God say? I will curse them that curse you. Yes. The curse is on them. You will never come and hear me speak where you won't hear hard truth when that's what the Lord says. My curse is upon them. So what he is saying in 38 and 39 is there's going to be an alliance led by Russia because second only the United States, who's got the power? Russia. Russia's got the power. Um, and you see, here's the interesting thing. What's the world calling uh, Putin? A mad man. He, he's not acting correctly. Think of the, think of the hooks in the jaw. He's going against resistance that most time they would just give up. But he, had, he is so uh, into this thing. He's, as, as they say in Hold'em, he went all in. He's all in. And the hooks in his jaw are driving him in a mad almost way, according to the rest of the world. They can't believe this guy's doing what he's doing. Putin is changing. He has changed. Yeah. If you watch videos over the past handful of years, there was an earlier Putin. No, this is the last day's Putin. And his heart is hardened. He has said, this I will do, not knowing that the Lord is saying to him, you are one of the wicked created for the day of destruction. Mm -hmm. I will drag you mm -hmm. to the place of destruction. I will annihilate you, O God. Yes. And all of your army. Yes. We're going to come to that. Now, there is an opposing cast. Interestingly enough, in that same passage, and we're going to save you some time here, but you can drill back down in uh, sessions 24 and 25 for the details. Scriptures also mention that there are a group of nations who oppose this. Mm -hmm. Who say, wait, aren't, aren't you invading the mountains of Israel? And stop. The mountains of Israel. God again and again says you'll invade the mountains of Israel. The mm -hmm. mountains of Israel. The mountains of Israel. What is that? I'll save you a lot of time. It's the West Bank. The mountains of Israel are on the West Bank. That disputed ground. Mm -hmm. Now, the UN says that ground belongs to the Palestinians, Palestinians. <laughs> in a two-state solution. Israel says, ooh, ooh. no, 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 no. That is our land. And by the way, it's strategic. Uh, you know, when we went over to Israel, we were standing up there on those mountains. They said... It is important that Israel have this property because it is a place where they have the high view. You can't, nobody can come without you seeing them. And so it's a very, very strategic it's place. A it's a barrier. It's a barrier. Well, you see, there's a group of nations. Not exactly. Well, in Ezekiel 38, the Lord says that Gog is going to strike suddenly with all of his armies and affiliated nations in a blitzkrieg on the West Bank. Yep. He's going to seek to take the mountains of Israel. Yep. And I mean take it now. Blitzkrieg, lightning war. More on that in a moment. The fact is that... Getting excited, isn't it? <laughs> there is an opposing cast. The, the scriptures mention specifically that there is a land, a place called Tarshish with its young growling lions that oppose this. Tarshish. 
Well, again, go back to sessions 24 and 25. You'll find out why, because we, we lay it out for you. I'll cut to the chase, though, and say Tarshish actually was located in England. Tarshish was the farthest place in the world you could go from Israel. Nobody knew any place further than that. As a matter of fact, that's where Jonah booked a ticket to when he was trying to flee from God. He bought a ticket on a ship to Tarshish. The furthest spot he could get away from. I, uh, there's no further spot. Well, Tarshish and its growling lions. And it also mentions uh, the land of Dedan. Come back to the growling lion. Dead? Saudi Arabia. The Saudis say, whoa. As they've been saying all along. They're basically the, Sunni. They're Shiite and Sunni. Sunni are the far more peaceful Muslims that are majority. But the Shiite are the militant and uh, extremist. And of course, you hear more about the, what they're doing because the others are not doing anything except trying to cause peace. So It's interesting that Tarshish has what God calls its growling lions, the children of Tarshish. That's a very interesting, because if you look at England, it actually is a commonwealth of 54 nations, mm -hmm. some large and powerful, some... Small, very small. But the king of the growling lions of Tarshish, you're sitting in it right now. The United States is the king of the growling lions of Tarshish. It was descended directly from England. Came directly from England. Is the number one superpower on the world. Came from Tarshish. And a people of many peoples living on many waters, with extraordinary resources, extraordinary wealth. No other nation has been wealthier, more powerful in the history of the world than this one, period. Mm -hmm. It is still, it is the only superpower in the world. Russia is a poor, pathetic, way distant, parsecs away, second place. So, we are with them saying, come on, you're going in there not to liberate the Palestinians, which is going to be the pretext. We're here to free the Palestinian people. About a week and a half ago, did you hear what Putin said? He said that the West Bank belongs to the Palestinians. He, that's his setup for going to the West Bank. That's how he's going to get the Arabs, uh, Shiites, to align with him to go up there and take that and then the, and their idea then is just to go right through the land, take the entire land. But just a week and a half ago on the news he said West Bank belongs to the Palestinians. That's the pretext. That's the setup. So I just, just want to let you know this is literally happening before our eyes like never before. And when this yep. part comes, it's the speed of prophecy being fulfilled has been increasing. Ever right. since, uh, seven, since 1948, uh, over 70 years ago, it has been increasing as time went on, faster and faster and faster and faster. The birth pangs are getting closer and closer and closer and faster and faster and faster. So in 48, they, you'd say, how could you see two witnesses killed in the streets and everybody in the world see it? I thought, well, maybe it's going to be projected in the air. No, no. Any cell phone can get a picture of it immediately across the world, immediately. Those things that are listed in the scriptures that are being fulfilled, and it's all happened within the last 70 years. All the technology that has occurred in the last 70 years has hastened this thing that God has already set in motion. It's already the appointed time. That's the point. This states clearly you are in the latter days. When I bring Gog of Magog down, you're in the latter days. That's what Jesus, that's what God says in his book. So we take a look at what's happening then in the last two weeks. After the Biden administration made a deliberate decision to start 
sharing intelligence about the fact that Putin's got something coming. This is not normally what national security an American president would do. They made a deliberate policy decision. We're going to leak this. We're going to put this stuff out. We're going to put it out officially so that people can ramp up as much opposition as they can to this. Now, Ukraine is not a member of NATO, so it cannot be militarily defended directly by counter-invasion. Um, it is not yet a member of the EU, although now the EU says we'll welcome them with open arms. But what the situation is now, with all the warnings in hand, then it wasn't entirely by surprise. I've been watching those warnings for months. It wasn't by surprise, but the suddenness of the strike and the thoroughness of him piling up 170,000 soldiers and then going in, well, he's all in now. You make that decision, you're all in. What Putin did not expect was the response he would get. Resistance. Inside of two weeks, the entire world changed. In ways that are so surprising that even those of us who have studied history and international relations for decades were just gobsmacked. The Swiss, for the first time in centuries, set aside their neutrality and said, you can't use our banking systems anymore. Flying zones, currency cutoffs, banking cutoffs, seize goods everywhere. What, what, everything you've been reading about is a humiliation to Putin. Understand, with all of his power, he ends up looking like a rust bucket nation. His soldiers not exactly doing uh, Hitler on Ukraine. Instead, his power is being exposed as being paper thin. Putin, in humiliation, stated that if anyone in the West, because he reconstituted the West overnight, he's reconstituted NATO, he's reconstituted the UN, he has reestablished American prestige, leading the opposition, and he did that by himself. Everything he feared has come to pass. God is ironic. And at the same time that all of this is happening, he's having to threaten to use nukes to keep everybody at arm's length. And since nobody's quite sure what the heck he would do, yeah, well, the nuclear option is not there. And by the way, in the scriptures, there is no apocalyptic end times. The whole world gets nuked. It's nowhere in the scriptures. You can discount that automatically. No, he just, he threatens it. That's the thing about nukes. But he's been utterly humiliated. It really is. There's no other way to cut this. He has created his own monster. The thing he wanted to destroy, he has risen up by his own evil deeds and hardness of heart. But I want you to understand, this is just the beginning. Putin has had a powerful military presence in all places in Syria. He's been established in Syria since about 2015. By the way, that borders Israel, and, the, and especially the, the Golan Heights you look, we, you look right from there, right into Syria. Now, he, is, he has literally been camped on Israel's doorstep since 2015. Yeah. He has bomber groups in there. He has fighter groups in there. He has armored groups in there. He's already pre-staged for an invasion. Several months back, they showed him visiting Syria, and they took him to the, what, what I would call the war room. And in this place, he could see on the wall maps of Israel. <laughs> this, this is months ago. His plan to uh, go into Israel has been going on for a long, long time. 
No. That's the end game. That's the hooks in the jaw. The hook is in. And the hook being in, every time you see Vladimir Putin's face on the screen, you're looking at a dead man. Dead man walking. You're looking at a child of hell. If you ever wanted to see what a child of hell looks like, look at him. This is, you know, saints, please be mature. God is, when God says things like this, your ears should tingle. I will drag you down and I will destroy you, Gog, and all your nations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so his temperament's changed. He's got a plan. Ukraine is only the template. Sooner or later, he's going to pivot and wheel south. He's already there. All he has to do is shift attention. And what's in Israel that's just recently been discovered? Two things, oil and natural gas, right off the coast of Israel, an enormous river reserve, gigantic. Mm -hmm. What does the Soviet, oh, excuse me, Soviet, Russian nation run on? Where's its only source of revenue? Gas and oil. Oil and gas. Well, they turned off Nord 2, so all of a sudden, that big deal, Germany told them to take a hike. Germany has reemerged. For the first time in 70 years, Germany is shipping its exporting weapons to Ukraine. It has not done that since World War II. Don't miss any of this, folks. It is right in your face. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, God said, just before I talk about Millennial Temple, let me talk to you about Gog, Magog, and his nations. You see, one important thing to understand is Gog is a pre-runner to the setup for the Antichrist because when he comes against Israel and God destroys them, after that the Antichrist comes up and says, I will protect you, Israel. I will sign a peace treaty with you for seven years. Yes, but how could he have done that? If you've, you're familiar with those passages... For decades, I wondered, how does the Antichrist simply waltz in and say, hey, here's a covenant for seven years, which, by the way, is the 70th week of Daniel. Yes. A seven-year covenant, peace treaty, peace for all. Everybody go out and have a drink because now Israel can do what it wants to, including rebuilding its temple on the Temple Mount. My reaction as a historian was, where the heck are the militant Islamists? Are you crazy? You've got... You've got millions and millions and millions of people that'll fall out of their tree, pick up whatever is next to them, a stick or a gun, and go march on Israel. That's yes. just, and they're right there. They're right there. Aha. Aha. God has a plan. There when they is. came back from Babylon, <laughs> they said, we need to purge the land and get rid of every foreign god. And if you have foreign wives, you're to send them away, and we're to clean the land. And what's going to happen is, and it's, there, do you remember that scripture where, that, about that God's going to force out even evil spirits oh, yeah, out, out of, of Zechariah 11, that when the Lord rules, two things are going to be driven out of the land as he rules in Jerusalem. Two very, and it's an interesting pairing. Demons. The Lord is going to Drive the demons back. None will be tolerated. The, the evil spirits of wickedness are driven out where they wander the land homeless someplace else. Right. But not there. The other thing, prophets. The prophet. When the Lord is sitting in Jerusalem, there are no more prophets. It's going to become a non-profit nation. <laughs> I'm you sorry. You stole I, that. I, I, I borrowed that from David when we were talking yesterday. Borrowed. That's my intellectual property. Uh, asterisk from Deck Dr. David. <laughs> well, let me hit one other thing here because, again, uh, we're low on time, but I want to make sure. From the 30,000 foot level, what happens is there's a sudden blitzkrieg of the West Bank, the mountains of Israel. Gog with all of the nations and peoples that are listed with him. So essentially it's the power of Russia 
and the power of militant Islam are going to suddenly strike in a coordinated operation, a blitzkrieg, in the mountains of Israel. According to this passage, Israel has to flee. Israel has nukes, but it doesn't have that many nukes. And it's technically still the West Bank, not Israel. And they couldn't use nukes anyway because they themselves would be wiped out. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's, there's just no way. This is a powerful enough force, second only to the United States. They can't touch any nuclear button because it's not, we're not talking Iran. We're talking Russia. They run because Israel is guaranteed, but the West Bank, you see, is contested. It's in dispute. It's unclear. And that is because the Lord says, no one else is going to help them. I am doing this, Gog. I am dragging you in by the hook through your jaw so that I might myself destroy you. This will be as it was in the days of Pharaoh, mm -hmm. when the Lord himself pleaded against Pharaoh with one after another after another destruction, lasting about a year. But in this case, God says, in one day, in one hour, when you come against my people Israel and are driving through the high mountains of Israel, the West Bank, I will annihilate you. My wrath will come up in my face. I will stand in thunder and you will die. Mm -hmm. All of you will be done. You'll be stricken with fire and pestilence, earthquakes. You'll be driven by fear to slay one another. You'll attempt to advance in the valleys, and the mountains will fall in on you. I will slay your entire army. There is not one survivor of this. This will be the greatest loss of human life because it appears to me the total hordes of the armies will number in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands. They will be slayed within an hour, all gone, all dead. God says to the carrion birds of heaven, come and feast. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, the Jews require a sign. Remember, they're always asking Jesus for a sign, a sign, a sign, a sign. When God does this, he says, my people will know who did this. They will know it's me, and they will turn to me. There's going to be a great revival in the, Israel. The whole world is going to know well, it. Well, yeah, the whole world there is going to know no, There's no rational explanation for what happens. An army of hundreds of thousands, perhaps approaching a million, is simply annihilated in one hour. Yeah, that's As right. a matter of fact, in 39 of Ezekiel, Ezekiel says, there will be so many dead that the entire population of Israel will be occupied for seven months just locating and burying the bodies. Yeah, that, burning the weapons, shields, arrows, javelins, so forth. Six and, dot and, four and million people in Israel. Fires with them for seven years. They will not take wood from the field nor cut down any from anywhere else. They're going to be using weapons for fuel and Israel yeah. after this. There's so much stuff left over, so much firewood. So much stuff that can be burned. <laughs> yeah. It'll take them seven years to burn the stuff, seven months to bury the bodies. And they're going to bury them to the northeast of the Dead Sea in a place ironically named the Multitudes of Gog. That's, God says, the name of that city will be the Multitudes of Gog. Okay. Is that interesting or not? This, Is that this specific? Answer, but this answers the question too, the one I've puzzled about for decades. How does the Antichrist simply step in and guarantee a peace treaty in Israel and you can rebuild your temple? Because Russia's power is broken and militant Islam is shattered. There is no opposition to that guarantee. That's why there is no mention of it. 
Now we're talking the ten nations. Now we're talking the church taken and the Antichrist appears. And I got a great deal for Jerusalem. Such a deal. <laughs> the false prophet proclaiming it. So, this is the very, this is from a very high level, strategic picture. Anytime you see, uh, this, if it's not Putin, I have no idea who it would be. There's nobody else but Putin in Russia. Nobody. He's 70 years old. Seven. He's 70 years old. He doesn't have forever. What an interesting age. 70. And he's already revealed how he's going to do it. Yeah. He's going to rationalize a pretext and then go in. He's been humiliated. Why? Because God is dragging him, a hook through the jaws is irresistible. That's why he won't quit. He's being dragged. No, he's, he's dragged. not going. To, matter of fact, he's not going to quit in Ukraine. He's just going to keep piling it on like the Russian bear always does. But then he's going to wheel and go south. Okay? Yeah. That's where we are right now. Yep. Keep an eye on. This is one of those times where watching the news every night is actually very interesting. It would be more interesting now that you got this framework to work within, to understand this isn't by chance, folks. This is by God's plan. By the way, everything's by God's plan, if you want to know the truth. It all, it's all under God's auspices. It's all under his power. It's all under his guidance. But here we see prophecy of the end time, latter days, being put in place with the scriptures telling us when this happens, you're in the last days, the latter days. We're in the last days of the last days. The last days, that's a good if one. If this is, if he is, who we think he is, and he's already started, he's already started to invade. So let me just say this in, in our closing up here. If you haven't asked Jesus Christ to be your personal savior, to forgive you for everything you've done wrong in your life, and you haven't been cleansed and cleaned and purified by him, don't wait any longer. Number two, if you have friends and family, it's no longer being patient in trying to reach them. Now is the time to be bold in the Lord and to speak the truth in love, in love, and bring them to Jesus Christ because the fields, according to Jesus, are white unto harvest. There's lots and lots of people who need to know Jesus Christ. This ought to stir you to recognize the time is short. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and make sure it's real. Make sure you know that you belong to him. And there's some information in 1 John chapter 2 that will help you with that. And if you know people need the Lord, please pray and do. Don't just pray. <laughs> Moses is standing at, at the Red Sea and, and he's praying and God says, stop praying and get moving. You know, you prayed long enough, you need to start moving. Here comes David.